Welcome to Digital Humans, a podcast where we learn from leading experts about how we can harness technology to evolve our organizations and our lives. This podcast is sponsored by Smart Lab. Hello and welcome to this episode of Digital Humans Podcast. My name is Jesse Tong, and I'm joined with my co-host, George Seiler. And today's episode is all about learning, and we're delighted to be joined by our guest today, Miles Runham, Senior Analyst in Digital Learning at Fosway. Miles is a, a veteran in the digital and learning space, boasting over 20 years in diverse experience in research, marketing, and business leadership. Notably, Miles led ASK.com's European business and spearheaded digital initiatives at the BBC Academy. Miles, welcome. Hi there. Thanks for having me. I'm really uh, looking forward to the conversation. It's a great pleasure to have you. Could you tell us a bit more about Fosway and your role as a senior analyst in the digital learning space? Sure. So Fosway Group is, um, we're a specialist analyst organization. So we focus on the HR and learning markets in Europe. We like to think we're the premier uh, um, service uh, for Europe for those. So we look at the HR talent and learning markets, principally focused on sort of technology and technology related themes. So that's, you know, platform provision in the digital learning space. It's a lot around content services and digital learning solutions. So Fosway's primary goal, I think, is is to help customers navigate the market and to make the most effective and useful, valuable buying decisions. So that involves us understanding market trends, technology trends, and reviewing and understanding the vendor space so that we can sort of decode that vendor space on behalf of buyers and potential buyers so they can approach the market with greater sort of confidence and clarity. Uh, perhaps the most notable uh, report that's offered is a nine grid report, which is sort of market highlights and analysis and vendor analysis for each of the segments in our space. And I'm responsible for that digital learning segment, which sort of alongside the learning systems. And you're in the midst of, uh, of, of the current evaluation, I understand as well. That's right. We're in the thick of it for, for the digital learning analysis. Yes. So we're sort of, uh, the, the analysis includes sort of data capture from, from a number of vendors. So about their features and functionality, about their sort of corporate and business performance. We run briefing sessions with each of the vendors to understand, you know, sort of talk through trends and get underneath the skin a little. And then we also, we supplement that with customer references. So we're in the thick of that now over the next, well, pretty much January and February sort of is my life is briefing meetings at the moment, which is, it's, it's fascinating, actually. It's really a really interesting part of the job. How are you seeing the, the customer expectations shifting and the market shifting? I mean, it, there's been such a, a, a rapidly evolving space in the last 12 months, certainly. So um, what are you seeing? Yeah, it has. I mean, and I guess, you know, it's, it's almost impossible to have any conversation about the digital learning market without using the words artificial intelligence. And I think that's, that's, that's a really interesting driver. I think what's, what's perhaps more interesting and perhaps more encouraging is I think there's a lot more meaningful conversation about understanding and demonstrating value in digital learning services now. So that's, you know, on the corporate side, I guess that's the broader value of an L&D function. So what, you know, what's this team here for? What value do we offer to the business? And how to be much more focused and targeted about that uh, and then how to work with vendors um, to sh ensure that you're demonstrating that. I think it's more, I think what's really interesting, I think it's becoming more than just a sort of simple issue of of trying to demonstrate the ROI of a program. It's more about understanding, you know, what what value is brought here. Why is this interesting? Why is it useful? And why perhaps relevance is the key. Why is this relevant to the business? And why is this relevant then to to the learners that that we're trying to support? So I I, th I think and I'm sort of hoping that that will direct some of the exploration of artificial intelligence to more in in, in the most valuable direction rather than just sort of keep up with the trends and adopt adopt because it's fashionable. We'll see. Maybe I'll come back to you on that in a few months' time when the analysis is complete to see you know which side of the uh, which side of uh, of that tension uh, we end up on. I suppose it does connect as well with the topic of in order to thrive as uh, what what we refer to on this podcast as a digital human. It really is important to have a mindset of constantly evolving your skill set and always learning. So, do you think that drives the L and D space and also learning outside of just 
the traditional L&D space, but just that mindset of always learning. Do you think that's that's a real driver of, of this acceleration on your side? I think... I, I... I think sometimes it is, and I think it should be. I, I think there has been, I guess, it's a bit of a tendency and a risk for, for L&D to sort of fall back to the tried and tested. So, you know, the, the creation of programs, design and development of programs and content. I think what's interesting now is the ability to and the enthusiasm to experiment. And I think perhaps that's where that kind of curiosity comes to life. And I, I think that's true for us as individuals. Um, and it's not so much to keep up with the trends. I think it's to find out what's valuable and interesting and useful for us. Um, so that might be, you know, using some of the, the, the latest tools and understanding, you know, how that changes the way we work or how we learn ourselves. And I think in the corporate learning context, I think that experimentation is really important to understand what's most valuable in your context. And that might be to inform the skills you need, you know, in your, in your team, it might be to inform, uh, you know, investment decisions, or, or it might be just to inform, you know, how you think the trends are going to develop your service. So I think that sense of experimentation, trial and test is, is, is really important. It's fascinating. Are, are you able to share any, um, exciting experiments that you've seen or come across through your through through your research recently like i'm curious as what's exciting you at the moment so i I think one of the things that's really interesting um there's been a lot of excitement a lot of buzz about digital assistants and co-pilots and you know the whatever that might mean i think one of the things that's that some some early conversations around this idea of kind of stacking stacking these assistants so they can they can manage a whole process automatically themselves so that might be you know you sort of have a hierarchy of of, of these uh, uh co-pilot tools that will manage you know so perhaps uh, you know a, a whole management of a process um to become quite sophisticated and quite powerful that feels like it's sort of some some of the early conversations around how that might change how systems are applied and managed in an organization uh, you know how that that really uh, you know sort of super powered automation uh, could become quite interesting. It sort of feels like a glimpse beyond some of the automation that we've seen with ChatGPT and generative AI tools. It's almost what happens when you combine these tools across an organization as they kind of manage themselves uh, or connect and, and coordinate with each other. I think that feels like a really interesting sort of perhaps, a, you know, an early signal of, of, of value that we haven't seen until more recently. And, and a follow on to that, what do you think is the, the time horizon that we're looking towards maturity of those things, because obviously there's data concerns, there's implementation considerations, there's adoption of ways of working, there's the whole AI accuracy at certain times. How far off do you think we are from realizing this type of vision that you're painting here? Yeah, I don't. I, mean, I think it's. I think it's still. It's still a good. A good number of years off. I mean, perhaps I, I want to be too precise as a hostage to fortune, and then this podcast <laughs> will haunt me uh, uh, at some point in the future. That's certainly not the intention. <laughs> it, uh, no, no, understood. But I, I think one of the interesting things is. I. Th I think there is a sense that the hype and the expectations are perhaps too high too soon. So I think there's there's an expectation. Perhaps this is maybe fueled by, you know, all of our own individual uses of tools like ChatGPT. We thought, you know, you had that sense of when you first use it yourself, you think, wow, okay, this is powerful. This is going to change things. And then that translates into an immediate sense of impact in, you know, in your in your job and in industry, et cetera. Whereas you've already referenced some of those challenges. And there's there's some more mundane challenges of just accessing budget to apply these tools, managing new technologies, potentially startups through corporate procurement processes, et cetera. You know, there's there's some sort of mundane and dull barriers. And then there's some of the bigger ones. I think that sort of data readiness feels like a really significant challenge for lots of organizations. Accuracy, reliability, interoperability, uh, you know, and, and I guess the availability of data becomes a really, really important implementation challenge. I think whilst the promise is great and perhaps the promise is right, you know, it's going to take some time for the, for the, the real value to unfold, you know, in our working lives. Perhaps maybe the one area where that's less true of is probably in the content design and creation where, you know, generative AI tools are so ready for that and are already maturing rapidly there. I think perhaps we'll start to see some of that impact closer to hand, you know, throughout the course of, of this year, maybe in you know, this year and into next. Thank you. That's a really considered answer. And it sounds like certain tools for specific jobs are at a point of maturity where they can already add value and be used. The mega opportunity 
is forming and there's glimpses of this, but there are n- numerous considerations to operationalize at scale. That's that's kind of what I took away from that. Would you say that's fair? Yeah, I think that's right. I, th- I think one of the things I think probably that that w- when we think about AI, we tend to think about generative AI now. And I think there's a you know there's sort of a little bit of caution there. There's other areas of sort of machine learning, personalization, recommendation, etc. That have always been well, it feels like they've always been around. That those will continue. I think one of the things that we often slip into when we talk about generative AI, we tend to be talking about automation, process automation. Uh, uh, it feels like that's that's an area where we will start to see, you know, start to see some of the, whether you call it benefit or risk, but some of the impacts perhaps more quickly of, of you know, some areas where you know what the process is, you know what the desired outcome is, and there's an opportunity now to kind of, you know, reduce the cost and increase the speed of, uh, uh, of those processes. So I think that's perhaps, you know, just sort of try and uh, uh, refine the point a little bit in that way. You are listening to Digital Humans, sponsored by Smart Lab, a leading experience management platform for events, learning, and change. So, Miles, we would love to hear some great stories from you. Um, what are the great examples of digital learning experience that you have seen? recently working as a senior analyst i was i was thinking about this the other day and I, i've just had this is sort of personal experience but 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 i think there's something interesting here that, that so i'm i you might be able to see in the background there I'm, I'm a terrible amateur guitar player who tends to buy gadgets to try and improve my playing which which never works so there's a sort of insight there <laughs> and i bought recently this small it's right it's a really small kind of digital amplifier the idea being this it's kind of you know hand-sized uh, uh, mobile you can take it away and I was trying to sort of set that up and f- figure out how best to use it. And one of the, one of the most useful things I found there was a sort of community. And there are these communities now all over, you know, YouTube and TikTok. For any, whatever your interest is, there's a community around it. And I was thinking that's something really interesting about the power of that as, as, as now a resource that I entirely rely on to learn anything now is that some, you know, that, that someone's got some insight. And I think one of the interesting things about those communities as well, and this, this might be particularly true of something that's, that's more in the creative field, like, well, my guitar playing is not necessarily that creative, but is that there's no right answer. This is kind of, if people are sharing their stories of like, I found it useful, but I use it this way and, you know, and share a little recording of that. And it helps me do these things. And I think that experience over the last couple of weeks has really sort of just highlighted the value of that of what community means for us as we learn and the fact that it's kind of global, it's entirely made up of people I would never have met, um, but there's all sorts of interesting signals of authority and trust in there and, and real, you know, really valuable problem solving. It was a personal experience that made me reflect on that value of community and the way that digital has kind of, you know, has enhanced that experience. That sounds brilliant. So much easier access to knowledge and also you can learn with the others as well, not necessarily having to go and find a teacher. Um, so another question around the hybrid working. So after COVID, most people don't work uh, full-time at the workplace or at the office anymore. Have you seen any changes in terms of the learning? It's interesting. I think I think hopefully with a slightly more sophisticated and mature response than, than previously, I think one of the challenges for learning and development when hybrid working arrived through the pandemic, while it wasn't so much hybrid, I suppose everything went remote, there was almost a sort of, you know, sort of keep the keep the vessel afloat. Lots of organizations responded by cre- switching to digital content and to virtual classrooms. And I think then as, the, as that experience has sort of evolved into some form of hybrid, I think there's a little bit more of a sophistication there. I think what I'm optimistic about is that there's a better sense, of, a, a sort of better design sensibility around that solution now of what's the context understanding the context for each individual and then designing an experience around that, not just saying, you know, that this is a question of distributing to hybrid audiences. This is about understanding the value in a hybrid context, using different tools. It may be, as we were just discussing in a community uh, content, it might be more on demand, not trying to wrap everything into content in a classroom and being a bit more subtle. And I think there's, a, you know, the, the, and the market has sort of followed that need. I think the challenge then uh, alongside that is the sort of the skills of managing 
that tool set and managing an ecosystem around the hybrid organization. Um, because, you know, as far as I see the, the data on, on what hybrid means, organizations are still experimenting and discovering what works for them, either mandating, you know, back to the office, you know, the sort of the, the Tuesday to, to Thursday in the office, or, you know, I think everybody's trying to find what works best. So I think having sort of finger on the pulse and being as responsive as possible to, to organizations as, as, as they emerge, you know, as their understanding emerges is, is really important there. And I see that as a kind of design challenge, I think, and the best L&D services are, are, are taking a design approach to that. That's brilliant. I mean, as an individual, I feel I'm much more empowered as well because I'm empowered to uh, to learn from anywhere and then through so many different platforms, tools, and then also channels. So let's talk about your BBC story. I was fascinated uh, when I look at your profile and then understand that uh, you spent many years working at the BBC. How different are the needs between a corporate and educational setting? Would you mind giving us a bit of a the point of view on that as well. No, I think it's interesting. So I arrived at the BBC in the BBC Learning Service, which is, uh, and the BBC Learning is if effectively the BBC's education service. And I, I arrived from from the search engine industry, a very product led organisation, into a, a kind of product service and media education environment. And one of the things I found most interesting and, and really kind of exciting was that in, in the school's context, the curriculum is a brilliant environment for product development. And that might sound slightly perverse because, you know, the curriculum is, is very uh, uh, structured and can be seen as, uh, I suppose, a restriction. Um, but one of the things that, that working to a curriculum allows you to do is to be very, very clear on your audience, very clear on your audience needs and very clear on what relevant content looks like. And the most clear example of that, I think, is the success of BBC's Bite Size product. And I was very, very lucky to manage the Bite Size service with, you know, this brilliant team with an established service, you know, a strong brand, et cetera. And it was just, but it was fascinating to see, you know, how the design choices revolved around understanding those needs for, you know, from the curriculum and that sense of structure and clarity of expectation it's not always present in an education environment, but that was really, really interesting. And it made, I suppose it made our decisions about prioritization and investment much, much clearer because we knew, you know, you know what's coming, you know when the exams are, you know what the big subjects are, you know what the exam bodies are specifying, and it gives you a really good sense of you know, how to design. And I think that that was a really interesting insight for me. And, and then seeing obviously how the team had evolved around that, that's, that's almost set of requirements. So that, I, that was probably the most important lesson I learned very quickly in joining the BBC. Oh, that's brilliant. And by the way, BBC used to be my client as well. So I did have a few years of experience working with them. Yeah. And that was another interesting point, actually, I suppose, to that the BBC was really, uh, it's perhaps less so now, but the, what has been right at the heart of digital content commissioning and digital service commissioning for a long time. So it's always had that sort of sense of kind of leading edge development and has been an attractive customer uh, for lots of agencies and, and suppliers. And that's a great place to be as well. You get, you have lots of interesting conversations. You're exposed to lots of interesting ideas because of that as well, which was great. A willingness to innovate and to try new ideas and, and, and experiment. Yeah, I think, I think there's partly an expectation as well. I, you know, again, I, you know, my time at the BBC is a little distant now, so I'm not sure the extent to which it's still true. But I think there was a, an expectation that the BBC would be trying to do new things. So, you know, when mobile content arrives or mobile technologies arrive or, you know, the internet itself, the web, the browser, et cetera, there was a sense that the BBC would be doing something to sort of evolve uh, itself and also to help, you know, kind of indicate to audiences what the value can be. And I think that was, a, yeah, that was a great place to be. You know, AI is the buzzwords. Uh, most of the software companies, they are talking about AI and also a lot of organizations, they are trying to understand AI. So in your view, what would be the impact of AI in the learning area? So I, I think... I, I, I think it's going to impact everything, really. So, so, but let's try and break that down a little bit more helpfully. I think we've already referenced. I think you know, automation will be an important impact. I think one of the interesting things, just to build on that point, is particularly thinking of generative AI tools. You know, they they, they work be they work brilliantly because they're excellent at predicting. And I think in a lot of the e-learning world, and this is going to sound uh, damning, but it, it is kind of predictable. So the formats, the, the, the modes, et cetera, are well established and very well known. So I think they're sort of ripe for, for automation. And so I think we will, we will start to see the impact of that. 
I think one of the, the, the most exciting things probably is, is this sort of sense of personal intelligence that can be applied in the learning world that will be able to understand individual context, genuinely personal individual context. There's, there's great potential there. I think that will help us then direct, you know, relevant skills development, uh, you know, and, and various capabilities. So it'll be able to give us genuinely personal sense of planning and direction and then monitor and manage and help our, our progress through those plans. So I think that sort of sense of personal intelligence is, is, is really powerful and skills intelligence sort of alongside that, the ability to digest and ingest vast, you know, sort of uh, uh, amounts of structured and unstructured data to help paint that picture. I think those are some of the most, the most interesting areas. Uh, um, so I think it, it's about intelligence. As as you mentioned though earlier, George, I think you know that that good data in is going to be vital uh, and understanding that. So I think you know our, our responsibility is to sort of be literate about what these tools are good for and what they aren't good for, and how you know how strong the data in is 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 going to be really important as well. But I think those are probably some of the the biggest areas. AI is very good at cleaning data though, yeah. as well, actually, and harmonizing disparate data sets. They talk a lot about data lakes, for example, and uh, having lots and lots of information from different areas. And then if you have a use case or a particular mission, <laughs> for want of a better word, to achieve, then the AI tools can really help to cut through all the noise and give you those insights in a very pragmatic way. And in a format and style and to a level of detail that you request. So it is really, um, it's very exciting when done right. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's right. I think it makes, it makes the, 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 the task of being a good data analyst much more achievable. Um, perhaps, you know, for those of us who might not have that background, I think, yeah, it becomes much more uh, uh, readily available. I think, which is, yeah, which is going to be really interesting. Those days of uh, using Excel only, um, it's gone. Right. So you, you will not have to do so much of the heavy lifting anymore. And that's a great news, right? For us all. That's right. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So should we talk about what good looks like? Miles, in your view, how to build a really effective digital learning program? What are the must do's for those people who are building their internal learning programs? I think that the key to it for me is relevance, I think. And I, I think this can be a challenge sometimes in the workplace context where, you know, an L&D team may be given a particular objective to follow. But I, th I think it's, it's about understanding what does personal relevance look like for your audience and treating that audience as, you know, as individuals, not just, you know, a cohort or a, an audience population. To understand that relevance, then I, I think a lot of it's about that sort of the, the design discipline of thinking through up front, uh, understanding, you know, motivations and attitudes and what the real needs are, uh, and not making assumptions there. So that's about sort of research and analysis if you, if you have the time. And I think one of the things that I, then this is probably from, from my search engine days that I think is really, really important is trying to find time and space to prototype and test, to, to check your thinking and work out what, you know, what does a relevant experience look like and understand that response. So I think it's not necessarily a technology challenge and a technology solution. It's a design challenge and a design solution. And it's not just about instructional design. It's about genuine sort of design thinking. And that might include now neuroscience or it might include behavioral science, et cetera. But bringing that understanding and discipline together sort of to, to be as sharp and relevant as possible, I think that's the key. We're going to do this in every episode where we ask our guests, if you look ahead into the next five years, what will it mean to be a digital human? And I think in the context of our conversation now, it'd be really interesting to gain your thoughts, particularly from a learning point of view and for, for anyone out there that's looking at where should I be focused on my development or how can I augment my skill set to prepare for the world that we're moving towards? Yeah, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? It feels like we're sort of, it's always been important to understand how tools work. And I don't just mean sort of technology, but I think how, how sort of, how the business of the economics of these tools work, because I think that feels like that's, that's a lot of the driver for this. And I feel we owe it to ourselves to sort of try and stay on top of that. We don't necessarily need to be experts, but I think keeping pace with what these tools are, you know, who's using them, who's making them available, why they were, why are they doing that uh, to, to be a little bit smarter about, about those questions, I think feels really important. I think being aware behind that, being sort of literate about our own data, 
feels like a really important uh, uh, survival technique, but also to you know to sort to take better decisions for for ourselves. I'm saying these things because I'm trying to do that for myself now, thinking, okay, well, what what is really going on here, and why why is it important? Why is it important to me? And I think one of the things that on the provider side, I think that but that's becoming really significant, particularly in the learning context, is how high expectations are now of how well understood we believe we should be. And so, so I think we're expecting really re- to be really well known. And it's an interesting balance. We're expecting to be really well known by the tools and the providers of the tools that we use. But we're also balancing that with, well, how, you know, how do they know us that well? And it's slightly sort of interesting tension between the data we give up or the data that's discovered about us that powers how well we're known and how great those experiences are and how we feel about that. I think that feels like something that we all need to be kind of, you know, as smart as possible about. Don't take anything for granted. If something, you know, if something's free, then, you know, then how and why is it free? <laughs> Those are the kind of questions that are preoccupying me now, are sort of approaching, you know, a, a, a the next chapter as, 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 you know, as we seem to accelerate even faster into this sort of technology future. Absolutely. Wise counsel there. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. Everyone for listening to the Digital Humans podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Digital Humans is hosted by me, George Silo, And me, Jessie Tong. It is produced by Jessica Wickham and John McGinty. Edited by Danny Cross and Chris Jones. This podcast is brought to you by Smart Lab. For an extended version of this conversation, visit our YouTube channel, Digital Humans. <laughs>